So hello everybody. Um, my name is Axel Schambach. I'm, I'm a professor at Hanover Medical School and I would like to welcome you to ESGCT's E-Series, a series um, of lectures about gene and cell therapy. ESGCT, the European Society for Gene and Cell Therapy, is a nonprofit organization aiming to promote fundamental and clinical research in the area of gene therapy, cell therapy, and genetic vaccine science. And part of our mission is certainly education and training, and we therefore launched the um, um, East GCT eSchool series. Part one, as you know, um, during the past couple of lectures was dedicated to the individual vector systems, including gamma retro, lentiviral, AV and adenoviral vectors, as well as non-viral um, non vector based tools, including Sleeping Beauty, and you might remember the nice lecture by Urs Geber last week, um, how you can exploit these viral mechanisms into vector development. Today, we will have our first talk of our series on vector production. And as you know, this is an important area in the translation of gene therapy to the clinical arena and to produce this for clinical application. Therefore, it's my great pleasure to introduce um, Hannah Lesch to you. Hannah is the gene therapy unit director at the Kuyupio I hope I pronounced that correctly, um, Center for Gene and Cell Therapy Private Research Institute in Finland. She holds a PhD in molecular medicine from the University of Kuopio and completed postdoctoral work at the University of California at San Diego and the University of Eastern Finland. She's also very active in academia associated industry, has a dual hat in that sense, um, and basically is also the R&D director at FinVector, a leading institution in GMP manufacturing of viral-based gene therapy products. With more than 15 years of experience in the field of gene therapy and vector production, I think she's a really great person to present this talk today, which is entitled, What You Should Know About Producing Gamma Retro and Lentival Vectors. I'm very much looking forward to hear Hannah's thoughts and insights um, into this interesting and really important topic. Hannah, please, it's up to you now. So. Thank you. So today I will take you to manufacturing uh, of gamma retroviral and lentiviral vectors. So Axel already, thank you, introduced a little bit of myself and I will a little bit continue. So uh, I have responsibility uh, of the uh, gene therapy unit in Kuopio Center for Gene and Cell Therapy also known as KC KCT. We are located there in the middle of the Finland uh, and uh, we are focused on developing gene and cell therapy uh, products uh, until the phase one clinical trials. So KCT's uh, disease indications are cancer, especially uh, solid tumors, glioblastoma and ovarian cancer and vascular diseases. Not only that we are located physically uh, in between the University of Eastern Finland uh, campus buildings and uh, uh, industry side, but also our functions are in between the academic and commercial biotech industry. We value a lot of the latest uh, technologies in analytics and manufacturing. KCT is quite small still. Uh, we have 50 people working and thus so academic and industry collaborations are really important for us. We are part of the Ferring family uh, and uh, related to FinVector. So uh, KCT has research and development facilities and development clean room, but also we have access to FinVector's pilot lab uh, where we can do our scale up runs. And then FinVector have uh, four GMP suites and, and really uh, 25 years experience in this field. So today's focus will be in manufacturing and less in virus uh, biology. So this will be my only really the introduction to the vector, uh, vector biology. If we think gamma retroviruses and lentiviruses in clinical trials, retroviruses are still one of the most used vectors in a gene therapy clinic. Total of almost 17% of the clinical trials has been done with gamma retroviruses. Lentis are fourth uh, common vector type, total of about 10% of the clinical trials. And if we combine, combine these vectors, all the retroviruses then becomes the mostly used vectors in a uh, clinic. 
both gamma retroviruses and lentiviruses, they belong to retroviridae family. They belong to orthoretroviridae subfamily, and the viruses are enveloped, RNA viruses, and the size is about 100 nanometers. Uh, viruses have a single-stranded RNA genome that is then reverse transcriptase, uh, transcriptase to DNA. Virus tropism or the vector tropism is altered by pseudotyping, and that means that you can change the viral natural envelope uh, with uh, another envelope from another virus. Typically, gamma retroviruses are pseudotyped with modified versions of the CAD in the Tino's retrovirus RD114 envelope and uh, uh, or a modified Gibbon ape leukemia virus gal. Typically, lentis, lentiviruses are suited up with vesicular stomatitis virus G. Retros infect uh, only the, uh, dividing cells, and lentis can infect both dividing and non dividing cells. Simple retroviruses uh, like, uh, contain GAC, BOL, and ENV genes. GAC for structural, BOL for enzyme, and ENV, of course, the envelope. And lentiviruses are called complex retroviruses because they contain also essential regulatory genes, DOT and REV, and then additional accessory proteins. Examples of the gamma retroviruses are, for example, murine leukemia virus and Moloni murine sarcoma virus. And example of the known lentivirus is, of course, HIV, human immunodeficiency virus, but for example, equine infectious anemia virus have been used in clinical trials. And here you can see the picture of the, of the virus. So genome is inside the capsid, which is covered by an envelope with envelope uh, proteins. Life cycle, it's an important to understand when we start to talk about production. So let's go this through quite fast. So virus, it binds to its receptor, it's internalized, and uh, it releases its genome. Genome is reverse transcriptase uh, to DNA, and then it forms a pre-integration complex to together with uh, viral proteins and host cell proteins. This pre-integration complex, it's uh, actively transported uh, to nuclei where the genome integration to the host cell genome happens. And this is now different with the retroviruses. They don't form a pre-integration complex and uh, are not uh, actively transported uh, to the nuclei Why retroviruses can only infect uh, dividing cells. Then from the genome, the uh, virus uh, uh, is transcribed or virus genome is transcribed and then a, a protein translation happens and then a virus assemble uh, with genome uh, and then virus is Bud, budding, budded virus uh, forms uh, is getting the final maturation uh, after after it releases from the from the cell, and and point out now that always lenti and retroviruses they take the envelope from the producer cell. So what is there on surface of the producer cell will be on the surface of the of the vector as well. So for safe vector production, it has become very important to split the genome parts into separate plasmid constructs. And this way, minimize the possibility to create replicating vectors. So typically, uh, gamma retroviruses, uh, they are in three different plasmids. One to provide gag and ball, another one providing envelope, and then a, a construct with the packaging signal contains the transgene. And this is now the only genetic element that is packaged inside the uh, forming vector. Lentiviruses, they have four plasmids. And, uh, and this fourth one is the REV regulatory plasmids, which is essential for lentivirus uh, splicing. These plasmids are then transfected to the producer cell, and then the cell becomes a virus factory. So in, especially in research, traditional vector production have been based on the advent 
human embryonic kidney 293 based cell lines, quite often 293 T cells have been used. And they have been grown in uh, flasks and transfected. Traditionally, old fashioned way has been to do calcium phosphate uh, based transfection, but it is really simple and cheap, especially in research for purposes. And then uh, the transfection with four, four or three plasmids is done and the vector for production is initiated quite fast after the transfection. And typically the first harvest of the virus can be done somewhere in 24 hours post-transfection, potentially up until the 96 hours post-transfection. And for research purposes, it's typically enough that you collect your superintendent and you clarify and you can concentrate the virus by ultracentrification. And that's fine if you are doing in vitro just to screen if your new contract is working. And, uh, but really the challenges in, in this vector type manufacturing is, uh, for example, that envelope, as an envelope viruses, these are really fragile viruses. And they don't, uh, you can easily uh, break the virus uh, and lose the infectivity, for example, with too high C4Cs or pH or salt concentration. And that is especially challenging for the purification of the modern technologies. As a budding virus, uh, one challenge is that uh, genetic, uh, generally low titers, so 10 to 6, 10 to 7 Q per mil is typically the uh, titer in the harvest. And this causes then a volume issue in later steps. Retroviruses have short half-life, 6 to 8 hours in 37 degrees which is also uh, challenging from the harvest point of view. Luckily, Lendi and Retro are more stable if you can decrease the uh, temperature, for example, two plus four. And uh, the risk is related always to replication competent viruses when we, when we talk, talk about these vector types. And this is of course uh, an unwanted effect in, a, uh, in a gene therapy vector. But today, when we are focusing more uh, towards the clinical trials, of course, the manufacturer, it should be controlled, automated, uh, and then the production should be done in a closed systems and, uh, and the product conduct material is recommended to be disposal. Uh, the future vision looks that the manufacturing is going towards the uh, continuous process, but more development work is required before it is a standard with uh, retro or lengthy manufacturing. Here you can see a different kind of uh, technology solutions and they are available. Mostly used today are uh, stirred tank bioreactors or the wave type bioreactors for suspension self, cells, disposable fixed bed bioreactors, uh, for example. The challenge may be the perfusion. Here is one, it's the ATF alternative ta tangential flow filtration from Replitzen. Very typical uh, process flow chart is, is seen here. So producer cells are typically stored in small, maybe one milliliter vials, and the process starts when you thaw your cell vial. And then you need to start your uh, expansion of your cells. When you have expanded enough your cells, you can inoculate them into the bioreactor, and then you continue still expansion of the cells inside the bioreactor. And when you reach the target, um, target cell density, then you can do the transfection or, or induction uh, to start your virus production. And after one day, a few days, you can start the virus harvest and your product is ready for purification. So I will go through in this presentation a few case studies and I will start from the work that we have done. So we have done Lendivara vector process development. Uh, we started a few years ago when we wanted to develop uh, our traditional flask process towards the more modern process. Uh, so we 
were interested using a isolis fixed bed bioreactor technology from bulk. We had worked with those bioreactor types previously with uh, adenovirus and AAV manufacturing. So here you can see a picture of Icelis nano bioreactor. It's a small scale bioreactor, which can provide a half a square meter to four square meter culture area for your adherent cells, depending on the carrier mass that is packaged inside the bioreactor. So here. And then uh, Bali is providing a large scale system, Icelis 500. Uh, which can provide up to 500 square meter uh, culture area for the cells. So when we start this work, we first wanted to, to study how is our cells behaving in this system. So how are they distributed, how to feed them, what is the cell target cell density in transfection, what is the cell density then we use in inoculation. In our hands, we selected 10,000 cells per square centimeter as, a, as a inoculation density. Icelis is providing two different compaction, high and low compaction, again, depending on how much carriers are packed. So we tested those both and noticed that uh, we get better productivity in low compaction and it was selected for the further uh, studies. We started, like our traditional uh, transfection was calcium phosphate based. We started from there, but quite fast we, we realized that calcium phosphate transfection was not uh, reproducible and, and scalable. And we started to use PEI Pro from Polu Plus. So transfection required quite a lot of uh, optimization. We optimized the uh, DNA, DNA pay ratios, plasmid concentrations and ended up at uh, the ratio of one to one and 300 nanograms per square centimeter. We tested different PAs as it's known to affect and different feeding strategies. So one thing in this uh, bioreactor system is that um, the volume inside the bioreactor is quite limited. And if you need to increase your media, because you need to feed your cells. One option is to do recirculation and have external tank for your medium, like in this picture. And in here, you can recirculate medium uh, from the tank to the bioreactor and back to the uh, container. Another way is really to do the perfusion where you feed your fresh medium to the bioreactor and yet then you uh, take uh, spent media away. We optimized harvest time points and also some uh, media supplements. If you are interested in, in further uh, of these experiments, you can uh, read our publication. So here is some results that we got. So the first picture uh, is showing the cell distribution in the fixed bed. And we noticed that we get a better cell distribution in the low compaction bed. So potentially that was the reason why low compaction is uh, having a higher productivity. Next uh, figures are glucose uh, concentration. So we optimize the perfusion so that we are keeping the glucose level quite down. And by this way, we were able to keep uh, cell growth uh, the same, but we use less media and uh, also the lactate production was more in control. So then we did, uh, after we have optimized the uh, process parameters in a small scale, we were ready to do the first scale up run. First, I sell is 500 using 100 square meter donut, like we call it, uh, and followed by a second run with 333 square meter bioreactor. Productivity was good, even better than in a small scale. And we ended up to the final yield of uh, four times 10 to 15 viral particles. Uh, PAL and Icelis are not the only disposable fixed bed bioreactors on the market today. So Universals have the Scalax family. Uh, Scalax uh, Hydra, it's a 2.4 square meter disposable fixed bed bioreactor. They have also the carbo with the middle size up to 30 square meter and nitro up to 600 square meter bioreactor. Uh, so we have tested also this uh, hydro bioreactors 
And our conclusion was that uh, hydro is working nicely for, for Lenti. We get better cell distribution uh, in this bioreactor type and productivity was same compared to the nano or even slightly better, but this would require some further uh, experiments done. So plasmids, many players on the field, uh, we included, have been using plasmid transfection in the production. So plasmid transfection, it is efficient today. There is a commercial, even GMP uh, quality transfection reagent uh, available, but it is quite expensive. So plasmids uh, allow fast turnover, for example, if we need to change a, a product to another one. However, when we go to the large fats production, it is requiring huge amount of plasmids and that becomes expensive. So we have expensive plasmids, expensive transfection reagents, and even it is affecting to the downstream uh, that we don't want to have a, a plasmid in our final product. So we need to use endonuclease and it's again, one more expensive uh, raw material in, uh, in the manufacturing. Someone has said that there can be also immune uh, system risk related to the plasmid, but of course I have to say that we can quite well uh, police the plasmids away from final product. But also the big, big risk that is seen in, in using plasmid is the potential uh, use of antibiotics in the plasmid manufacturing. We don't want to carry on the, uh, the antibiotic residuals to the patient, but especially risk is seen in horizontal transfer of the antibiotic resistant gene if it happens to go uh, with the product to the patient. So, so then the solution is antibiotic free plasmid manufacture. One example here is the mini circles by plasmid factory. So then we are going from plasmid transfection towards the producer cell lines. So producer cells, packaging cells or staple cells, how do you want to call it? It means that your cell line, it contains all the elements that are required for the virus production. So like in this, this figure there, you have a cell that contains gag ball and end uh, gene already integrated into your, uh, your cell line and you induce your vector production by transfecting only with one plasmid, it's already a straightforward, uh, more straightforward option than with three plasmid system. But of course, the development has going further and further and, and today the stable cell lines don't require any more of this one plasmid transfection at all. But challenge is really related to the toxic viral proteins and the only way really uh, to do stable cell line has been to use some kind of inducible system to, uh, to uh, minimize the possibilities that uh, your viral proteins, your en envelope protein or your transgene is toxic for the producer cells, uh, which have direct effect to your productivity and final yield. So the first uh, development was started with uh, murine cells for uh, retroviral vectors, uh, but quite fast uh, it was realized that there is a risk that you are developing a murine virus using a murine cell line, which have make it's containing the natural murine retroviral sequences, and and quite fast then the interest was uh, turned to, towards the human cell line. And today, two tree based cells are the most commonly used and, and partially also because they are more easier to adapt to the suspension growth. So a development of the staple cell lines, it can be, it can take really a long time. It can be really expensive. And that's the reason many um, players are still using the plasma transfection. However, if we think the, uh, the final goal, it's the clinical manufacturing. So less you have steps, better it is, and better your clinical manufacturer, it's more straightforward. So 
So then let's look at another case study where ADVENT, a retroviral vector stable cell lines were used. So this study is uh, from MORMED and the data is from Giliana Vallanti's uh, webinar available from the internet. Uh, so MOLMED was also using Oisellis uh, bioreactors, and they developed a large-scale production for the adjuvant uh, retroviral producer cells. So uh, they also did a process development in using a small Oisellis nano one square meter bioreactor, and they concluded that more you, more they have optimized, of course, more productivity. Or the productivity was increased, which is, I guess, natural. And then when they did the scale up one to 133 square meter, the final yield was almost 10 to 12 uh, transforming units. So MOLMET has been comparing the retroviruses to, to produce in Isolis Nano, Isolis 500, and then send cell factories. And they have concluded that productivity and uh, potency are comparable. And, and even potentially there is now less impurities uh, in, in the material produced in bioreactor. Uh, then the development of stable packaging cell lines, it has been a little bit more troublesome, especially because VSVG is toxic and, and the viral proteins are toxic. But here is a list of the cell lines scattered by Otto Merten in his review article. Uh, as you can see, most of the cell lines developed are based on tetracycline regulation uh, and inducible inducing system. Uh, there is also con constitutive uh, cell lines available, but here, if you can see, that then constitutive uh, production have been active only when the VSVG has been replaced with another uh, envelope. Um, I want to also highlight uh, that after Merten's uh, review article 2016, few other publications that has came out. So first here is a cell line developed by Sven Andros group. So they have developed uh, HAK 203 SF stable inducible cell line, which is based on a doxycycline and humate double regulation system. And uh, this cell line was, was uh, planned to be used in uh, Lendivirus reference standard material production, but to be seen how, how that project is going. Then another interesting article, it's coming from Anna Sofia Korodinhas and Manuel Carandos group from IBED. So they have uh, overcome the problem related to the uh, toxicity of the protease by modifying the protease protein. And then the last, um, paper comes from the Naldini's group where, where they have developed not only a producer cell line, which is, uh, uh, but, but they have also modified the cell line to be to thinking a virus quality. So they modified, uh, they wanted to have a cell line to produce lentivirus that uh, is uh, reducing the potential uh, that lentivirus could activate T cells in a patient if you have a direct in vivo uh, administration. So, uh, so they modify cell genome that it do not contain anymore the major uh, histocompatibility complex class one. And by this modification, they were able to ensure that this MAT molecule is not on the, on the virus surface. As you remember, that virus is taking the envelope from the producer cells. So what is there on the cell surface will be there on the surface of the virus. So suspension then. It is uh, really an interest today to develop a suspension processes. It is say, it is easy to scale up than advanced uh, system. 
and, and it is really a practical solution. HAK2 and 3 cells are easy to grow in suspension, and today there is a bioreactors, disposable bioreactors available. Stirred tank bioreactors and wave bioreactors. Uh, compared to the fixed bed bioreactors, uh, the suspension consumables are maybe somewhat cheaper, uh, but challenges are more related to, to the perfusion. In fixed bed bioreactors, it is gentle, but with uh, suspension bioreactors, when your cells are floating there, uh, there is, it's more troublesome. Uh, ATF or TFF uh, are options, but then the fragile nature of the virus is, is a bottleneck. Suspension uh, bioreactors are seeing a possibility if we think the continuous processes as the cells are, are dividing through the process. And if you have a continuous process and a system, at some point you just, uh, the cells come confluent. But in suspension, you are able to keep the cells uh, alive a uh, longer time. And not only that we are always focusing on what's the, the large scale and how, how large we can go, important is also that we need to have tools to study the small scale uh, options. So for example, Sartorius Amber family is good uh, tool to do the process development in small scale. So important is that in, in suspension, we don't need to use a serum, FPS, in clinic, uh, clinical quality, it is really expensive and you can purchase in only for the limited sources. And, and good is that uh, very uh, good serum free medias are available today. If you have uh, uh, cells that you need to transfect, also transfection reagents are there, PEI Pro or uh, for example, LV Max from the Thermo Visser. Geneton has uh, at least published a 50 liter uh, manufacturing process in suspension for Lendi and it's working well. Electroporation is said to be one option for the suspension cells like maxide and nucleofactor, but uh, I think that today the scale is an issue there rather than the technique itself. But, but really a for the staple cell lines, the suspension is a uh, way to go. I wanted to mention one example uh, that it, it's the Oxford Biomedicals work that they have uh, publicly say that they have developed a uh, stable cell line for 15 years. Today, they have a stable cell line for Lenti uh, commercially available, but it is just highlighting that well, the work is huge behind this, uh, this product. So this next slide take us to virus purification. The main obstacles in the uh, retro or lengthy downstream is, have been the handling of the large volumes and then the loss of the functionality during the processing. Also the fragile nature, uh, short process time and limited number of the process steps are essential uh, for the vector recovery. So different groups have been developing own process ap approaches and there is not a single and the only uh, process available, but mostly always this downstream uh, contains following uh, steps. Uh, clarification, concentration, capture and final concentration and formulation. Uh, DNA reduction is typically done by endonucleases and, and it can be at the beginning of the process during the harvest or, or, or then after the clarification. Uh, DNA reduction is done by, uh, for example, benzonase generase or some HQ nucleases. Clarification uses quite often the depth filters Concentration and buffer exchange is typically done by tangential flow filtration and capture is a chromo-based step. Onion exchange or affinity typically. And then comes the final formulation and concentration typically done by TFF again. These, these technologies that are highlighted 
are available in large scale and in disposable mode. One case study more. Uh, so this is done. Uh, this is the our work that we just published a couple months ago. Uh, we did lentivirus process development uh, for the material that we received from ICLS bioreactors. And our downstream process, it follows quite uh, well the typical steps, as you can see. And we did a lot of testing in small scale, uh, tested different materials, conditions, and, and those were compared and, and optimized. And those uh, that, that you can see from our publication. Uh, but, but here is then the results from the scale up run that we did, uh, that we had 178 liters of the material that came from the bioreactor and it was clarified by Millistack and uh, recoveries were good. And then it went to TFF. Uh, we use 100 kilodalton hydrosal cassettes. Uh, the bottleneck in our hands and typically in the field is the chromatographic step. We use sartopine here and, and uh, recoveries were somewhat uh, decreasing. The final formulation, concentration and formulation was again done with the TFF using the Hydrosart uh, 100 kilodalton cassette, but this time a smaller cassette was, uh, was enough. And the virus was uh, uh, formulated to the buffer that you can see in the, in the slide. Formulation is an own story, uh, but you need to have a buffer that is suitable for to, to keep your product if you freeze it, to stabilize it. And if, if you are using it for in vivo, then it's critical that your final formulation buffer is that kind of buffer that can be administered to the patient. Ex vivo is a little bit easier. We get some 10 to 9 uh, transforming units, total of 570. Uh, mills from this run. And, and one uh, key in this process development is really that typically the groups are doing process development upstream and downstream at the same time. And if upstream is developing and optimizing, the material that comes to the downstream team is always a little bit different. So we solve this uh, by making one, the one first ICL is 500 run, and providing material for the downstream so that they could have a consistent material for their optimization studies. So thorough testing of the vector is done already in, in preclinical states, but especially when the material is produced in GMP. So in this slide, you can see example of the pattern of the release essays. So products are characterized for safety, sterility, identity, purity, and, and activity. And as you can see uh, with several uh, different essays. Uh, the characterization uh, of uh, biological activity for gene therapy, it follows the uh, regulatory guidelines. So, so safety testing will be always unique and it is a product specific uh, um, essay. But modern technologies are needed to deepen the understanding, the robustness and quality control of the process, but also the final product attributes. So, and earlier you can do your, uh, thorough analytics and you know the process and it demands it better for you when you understand your product, product and your process uh, better for later states. So what happens when the product is going towards the clinic? So first is of course the research and basic research. And if we look this from the manufacturing point of view, research great production in traditional flask, it's, it's totally okay. But then when you are going further to preclinical studies, you should use the virus that is produced in the process that is already defined. Uh, preclinical uh, officer safety and tox uh, studies 
should be done with the material that is uh, mimicking the GMP grade uh, GMP manufacturing, but the product do not need to be yet done in, in GMP. So the manufacturing of the GMP material, it is quite complex and it really differs from the standard uh, truck manufacturing. We need to follow the regulatory uh, requirements that are set by FDA to US, EMA to, to Europe, but of course, for example, Asia, they have their own regulatory system. Material that is produced uh, must be fully characterized as I already saw in a previous uh, slide. And in addition to the release, uh, essay, supporting essays may be needed, but a sponsor needs to provide also the stability data for the uh, regulators. If there is any changes uh, no noticed uh, during, uh, or during the process uh, development or product life cycle, uh, then a sponsor needs to provide a thorough comparability data to show that the product is still the same and that uh, it needs to be done with the qualified and validated essays. But of course, that's something that is not, not wanted, these changes. And when you are going then uh, further towards the commercial stage, you need to understand your product's uh, quality attributes and critical process parameters. This is my final slide. It just concludes the importance uh, of, of the field and its the money. Uh, production of gene therapy, uh, cell therapy, uh, vector, gene therapy vectors and cell therapy products are, it's really, really expensive. It is expensive because the GMP level raw materials are expensive, equipments are expensive, analytics is eating a big bite. And, and then a lot of money goes also to, to the facility to uh, keep the facility up and running and then all the supporting actions and human resources. So what can we do to someday to be able to, to decrease the, uh, those price? I think big uh, responsibility here is in process development that process development team we need to be able to increase the productivity, uh, maximize the recovery, potentially think of automation to minimize all the risks from the humans, maybe um, op optimize the raw material supply. If you go towards suspension, you have serum reproduction. If you go to the stable cells, you, you are saving your money going to the transfection as discussed. And, and also that's something that is not in, in the process development team's hand, but is more on the field that more there is uh, suppliers, uh, the, it will become also uh, bring also the competition, competition, which will bring potentially the money for the raw material down. Then one thing is also that what is a good batch size, uh, yield versus risks, and, and final is then uh, the logistic uh, issues. But that was uh, the story I wanted to uh, share with you. Thank you for all listening. I wish you all a very good summer and stay healthy even in this uh, challenging uh, situation in the, in the world. Thank you. Yeah, Hannah, thank you really um, a lot for, for that quite interesting talk. You know, it, uh, I think we really learned a lot and um, gained a much better insight now into vector production issues. And um, I think you gave lots of quite valuable examples how one could do this and what the, the caveats and bottlenecks are. So I think that's um, highly valuable to, to our audience. And before I um, start with the first questions, I would like to encourage our audience to basically enter your questions into the chat that you find on the site. And, and certainly I would then pass on the questions to Hannah, who's, I, I guess, happy to answer those. And, and Let's see what other questions. Yeah, that's right. Okay, let me start with the first question that I see in the chat here. So um, the first question is from Mai Lin, a PhD student at Hanover Medical School. 
And she says that you mentioned that muon packaging um, cell lines can produce muon viruses as a side product, but the same can occur in human packaging cell, cell lines, right? Isn't that more dangerous, she asks. Uh, so uh, this, um, where, where can I start? So uh, replication competent virus is something that we don't want. And how it may happen in the production is that uh, recombination happens so that uh, my vector that should only contain the transgene cassette is kind of like taking with it uh, the, the components that are required for the replication. And, and absolutely, uh, you are correct that in human cells, it is theoretically yeah, also possible. But, but my example to the murine was that when you have a murine virus and you have murine cell, and in the murine cells, you have murine retrovirus sequences, there is a homology. And more you have homology uh, areas in the sequence, it is kind of like easier for recombination to happen during the, the manufacturing. And, and to minimize all the homology areas, areas has been a key to develop a safe, safer uh, plasmid-based system and safe uh, stable cell lines. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Um, there is another um, um, a bit related question to what you just said, again by Mylene. And she asks, um, which method is generally more efficient, stable or transient um, virus vector production? Uh, I don't know exactly what is the um, behind this question. Maybe it is the productivity, mm -hmm. and uh, and if we think the productivity, typically it says that ten to six to ten to seven uh, uh, tighter is reached. Uh, some data I have seen also ten to eight uh, virus tighters in the harvest. Of course, the tighter is also a little bit volume dependent that if you decrease your media volume, you are actually increasing your tighter. But, but to my best understanding is that either one is, is productivity better. So it, it really depends. But uh, 10 to 6 to 10 to 8 today is the range that uh, people are with transient and uh, stable uh, systems. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, maybe um, as um, do, doing, um, you know, the others um, in the audience entering more questions into the chat, I would also have a couple of um, questions in that regard. Um, I mean, in the transient production scheme, you would primarily produce from episomes, while in the stable production, it would be from an integrated retrovirus. I mean, from a, from a retrovirology standpoint, I mean, how prone are these two different methodologies to silencing. I mean, is that a lot of silencing or is that something that you don't really see during production? Um, what do you think about that? So it's, uh, I, I think, a good comment that I didn't touch at all. So silencing is really not an issue with the transient system uh, because it is, it's just take a few days and potentially maybe there is some silencing happening, but that doesn't influence so much because anyway, uh, it is a short term, but that is really an issue in the in the uh, stable uh, producer cell lines that you see decrease in the tighter because of the silencing. Okay, um, and do you have any suggestions how to prevent that? Is there any logic, ingredients, um, epigenetic I'm modifiers? And... That goes some somehow out of my my real, real area, so. That I don't know a solution that I can share with you today. Okay, thank you. Um, there's another question by um, Hong Li um, Huan. Um, and um, um, basically the question is how to distinguish full functional lentival vectors from non-functional empty lentival vectors. I, I like this question and it's really challenging to, to even answer shortly because the whole analytics and tiring, it is complicated. And each lab has different methods. So it's first of all, really challenging to even compare my results to your results and the tighter that I have get from my cells, what you are getting your, in your cells. And, and key to be able to compare is that if we get a good land device reference standard, so we could even start to really get a better understanding and comparability between the labs. Then what comes to the full and empty or functional and non-functional viral particles, there's a lot of different methods to, to do those uh, assays. Uh, quite 
Often and mostly people use P24 ELISA, which is a capsid protein ELISA, as a viral particle targeting. It is not the best because it also analyzes all the free particles. It doesn't say that my particle is four or even a, like a, a, a particle, but uh, not a free protein. Another method to use viral particle targeting is, for example, the HPLC. Uh, then there is today these nanocyte, virocyte uh, particle counters. And then you can count, for example, measure your genome number. So qPCR or DDPCR, so you can get a kind of genome number which reflects your, your uh, particle number. None of these are showing that your virus is uh, functional. It's uh, effective uh, to transduce. And for that, you always need to have some kind of uh, a functional titering, which is which means that you need to transduce your cells and then analyze how many viruses are able to transduce and then compare those. But but today there is not a clear essay do this and that and everyone is doing like that. So so keep that in, always in mind when you are reading the article and you are comparing the data or comparing the number that the comparison is quite challenging. Thank you, Hannah. You also mentioned during the talk that one of the advantages of integrating um, retroviral vectors, including lentiviral vectors, is that the ability to be pseudotyped. And yep. um, you also gave um, lots of beautiful examples what you can use there, um, and gamma ape leukemia virus envelopes, um, RD114, for instance, BSVG. There's certainly also the ones for measles and, and nipper um, envelopes. I mean, how difficult is it for a large center like yours um, to basically switch from VSVG to um, different pseudotypes? I mean, do you have to do a lot of adaptation or is it a standard scheme and you just have a couple of wires that you have to reconnect, let's say? So it depends if my manufacturing is based on the plasmid transfection or the stable cell lines. And, and if it's plasmid transfection, it is quite actually really straightforward. So I just basically change my VSVG plasmid to with another plasmid. Let's say that I'm using the RD114 or I'm using the TP64 from the bacterial virus. It just means that I change this plasmid to another one and I do my manufacturing or transfection, transfection the same way. Uh, however, the, the challenge comes then from the downstream part. So if I have been a straightforward plasmid transfection and now I have a new virus envelope, does it affect to my purification? Is my virus still as stable so I can use the same uh, uh, purification step? Is my virus still quite the same that it's behaving in the chromatographic step and binding more or less the same way? But I see that the pseudotyping is quite straightforward in, in plasmid transfection. But then if I have a stable cell line, it more or less means that I need to start my work from the beginning. So I need to somehow create my cell line again that I have there my new, new pseudotype uh, in my, my cell line. Yeah, thank you. Maybe also another question regarding production. You mentioned the risk of replication-competent lentiviruses and replication-competent retroviruses. And how, how frequently do you see this? I mean, according to the literature and according to my experience, we are always asked, you know, for good reasons, maybe to perform this essay. But I think most of the vector producers have never really observed that during clinical production. Can you comment on that? I can comment that we have never seen it. So, <laughs> so with Lendy, especially what, what I have been more about, I, I think that it's more theoretical risk. But, uh, and, uh, but we need to study it. I have never seen it. And, uh, but also that we need to keep in mind that, that this is the safety aspect that uh, it has been done. A, it has focused a lot in uh, construct design that there is a minimal uh, homology areas and that is really keeping the potential even to to form these uh, replication component viruses but but the risk is there and that's why we need to just do it we need to also study the sterility and purity and rcl so it kind of like for me it fits those to those essays that we need to do for safety purposes but personally i see that the re real risk is quite small 
Thank you, Hannah. Um, there's another question by Hongli Huan, and um, basically the question is, um, due to the host cell contamination, what purity, brackets um, in percentage, is, acceptable, uh, is an acceptable purity for a clinical trial with a lentival vector? So for that, only thing what I can answer is that I, I um, we should follow the regulatory guidelines and I don't want to say more than that. So, so we need you, I recommend you to, to look for the guidelines and then uh, make your own uh, judgment for that. Thank you. Um, you also mentioned um, that some people use um, 293 and others 293T packaging cells. Is there a real advantage or necessity to use the one or the other? So this comes from the history that uh, at some point uh, we, it was thought that uh, we have an episomal plasmids in my, my 293 cells and my cells are dividing. So maybe I'm losing my plasmids through the cell uh, division. Uh, so it was developed a 293 T cell line so that I have my T antigen expressed in my cells and, and my plasmid is having a T antigen origin. So the cells that have T should be keeping better my plasmids in, in those dividing cells in episomal states. Uh, those cells, naturally, clonal selection, are quite easy to transfect, those 293 T cells. However, today, not all the plasmids are containing any more this T antigen origin, repl replication of the origin. So my personal thought is that T antigen is not anymore absolutely required for keeping the plasmids. Anyway, my my atrient cells are not very many times anymore uh, dividing anyway. Um, another thing is that there is one, at least one publication, I don't unfortunately now remember the, the authors, but they have shown that if you have T antigen expressed in the cells, it is actually naturally boosting the virus production. So, so yes, there can be some advantage, but, uh, but you could, you can do also in two non three cells. Thank you. Um, um, you also mentioned that you had switched from calcium phosphate to pay, pay um, polyethylene mm -hmm. pro um, um, transfection. Um, so, so what's so specific about the, the pi in that regard? Is it simply that it's a certain size of the polyethylene amine um, with branches um, associated to that, um, or is that a specific GMP, um, you know, a, a drug that you could add under GMP conditions as well. Can you add a bit more to the rationale why this is um, um, a, a better and more useful tool for, for retroviral production? So we started with calcium phosphate and in-house kind of buffers. And, and every time, even though we think that we were doing the buffers same way and storing the same way, we were not able to reproduce fully do the, the manufacturing in the bioreactors. And we changed to PEI, polyethylene imine. Uh, we have done also PEI in-house, but quite fast we realized that we want to focus on the work that we are uh, here for to do the uh, virus manufacturing and not so much on the PEI uh, solution making, buffer making. Uh, so we wanted to have a, a product that is a standard quality without causing an extra uh, factor for our, our work. Uh, so we changed the PEI Pro from Polyplus because they are Doing it, the quality stays the same. And important for us is that it is coming as a GMP quality as well when, when needed. So we didn't want to, to cause any changes in later time point that we do something uh, something in-house and, and it might affect to, to the manufacturing. Thank you. Um, and then maybe one final question from my side. I think during your purification scheme, you mentioned that the clarification step, you know, involved a filter of 0.6 to 1.5, 1.1 micrometers. I mean, considering the size um, of, you know, retroviruses that are typically in between 100 and 200 nanometers. Um, um, I mean, what's the, the rationale of having a, a larger pore size? Are there aberrant particles sometimes that have variable sizes, or why is it important to have a bigger pore size in, in that regard? So 
the primary goal in clarification is to, to remove the cell debris. And, and cell debris is typically in a bigger, uh, bigger parts. Uh, another way to look at this is that Lendi is and retros, they are small, but really fragile. So, so it's kind of like optimizing that what is the pore size enough that I'm happy for the purity after the first step, uh, taking into another balance that what is the recovery of my very fragile virus. So, so the first is the bigger pore, also that I don't uh, block my filter with, uh, with everything. So bigger pore, filter, get ri rid of the cell debris. And then the next is TFF, uh, where the pore size is really uh, small then and keeping my virus. So, but, but also that uh, depth filters aim is, it is for purification, but the actual purification step will be then the chromo, but it is now more to get rid of the, the cell debris. Okay, fantastic. Um, maybe um, one last comment from my side. I mean, since you are a person that has um, a dual hat on in between academia and, and industry, is there any advices that you can give our younger people, the PhD students in the audience um, regarding career development or something like that, or encouragement regarding um, career pathways and vector production? So my comment is really for go, going towards the documentation. So even though you are doing your master thesis or, or you are a young scientist and you are doing your lab work, you don't know if your product someday will go to the clinic. So it can be valuable. So don't underestimate your, your work. And then the key is the documentation so that you keep your notebooks uh, according to the like the instructions, so more or less write down everything. Write down your product history, what you have done, how how you have done, because maybe someday your work will uh, be part of the product that goes to the clinic. And then when you go through the product's history, I think the biggest um, risk or the horror is that. We should start from the beginning just because someone didn't document the, the work uh, properly. So documentation from the beginning. Yeah, I think that's a very important um, point and certainly a very nice point of, of closing. Um, I don't see any further questions basically um, in the chat, um, but certainly if you have any more burning questions, feel free to forward to us the questions and then we will forward that to Hannah. And um, with that having said, certainly I would like to thank Hannah once more really for a great talk. Um, you very nicely explained, you know, all the caveats and bottlenecks, but also the big fascination um, of how these things can be done and can be carried all the way to the clinic. Yes. Thank you a lot. For thank that. you. And my email address is visible. So of course, personal contact. Okay, fantastic. Maybe as a very last remark, um, I would also like to invite the audience to join us next week for the talk of um, Eduard uh, Ayuso. Thank you, um, who is depicted um, here. Um, Eduard is from the University of Nantes and he will um, talk about what should, what should we know about producing AAV vectors. I think that will be also quite fascinating and fits to the topic that um, Hannah and mentioned today. And with that, I would like to close this um, series for um, today. And um, thank you for your attention and say um, goodbye. Thank you.